going to start. So today we have a very special guest. He's a veteran of humanitarian crisis and ethnic cleansing in Iraq, Rwanda, Bosnia, Afghanistan, and Sierra Leone. He's a medical doctor, a professor at Manchester University, and special representative of Egypt's Press. Today we are honored as we have the man who sounded the alarm on Darfur. He refused to keep quiet. This is Dr. Mukesh Kapila as he shares his personal account of exposing the genocide in Darfur while serving as the United Nations Resident and Humanitarian Coordinator for Sudan. Please welcome Dr. Kapila. Thank you very much uh, indeed and delighted uh, to be here. Uh, I've been here for the last couple of days listening and learning. I'm impressed by the solidarity and energy in the room and I've been shocked by the testimony of the continued suffering that uh, many people here from the affected areas in Sudan have also been sharing with us in the last uh, couple of days. And I've also been strengthened by the resolve of Sudanese friends here to, to right the wrongs against them. One of the things that has struck me is the angst amongst our American friends, their frustration at the US administration's fickleness. We had this in the session immediately before, and this has been one of the recurrent uh, uh, themes. I had to be careful here what I say. I still you know, need to navigate uh, the immigration people at, at, uh, at, uh, at uh, JFK on my, uh, on my uh, uh, exit, and like to be let in again as well. You know. But in consolation to my American friends, let me say, in the words of the great British leader, Winston Churchill, who helped end the Holocaust genocide. And what he said was, you can always trust the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> now, Churchill's mother was American, and presumably he gained this valuable insight from his mother's milk, so he must be right. <laughs> and so it is, my dear American friends, we all know, actually, that Americans always end up, they end up always at the right side of history. And for that, the rest of the world honors you. So it may well be that along the way, there are stumbles, sometimes wrong corners, sometimes timorous behavior, sometimes shabby deals, and there are many examples of that in all democratic societies. Probably America is no better or worse than that. But what is unique about America the country that helped invent the United Nations, the country that ended slavery, the country that inspires countless movements for freedom and peace around the world, that ultimately ends up in the right. Let's never forget that. We may have problems with the administration now or in past administrations, but administrations come and go. The nation and the people are much greater than any of that. So I salute you. Of course, much more needs, uh, needs to be done here, and what's done here is extremely important to the rest of the world. That's why the efforts that take place here in the United States are of vital importance, not just here, but for all the countries of the world where America and Americans still provide uh, leadership. The world is more equal and will get more equal, and that is a good thing. Americans should not get arrogant about them ruling the world. But at the same time, there is a special responsibility here. And that's why it's been such an honor to be here, to share with you, to learn from you, and to take away from here what, how we might actually mobilize around the world. Now, we've discussed in the last uh, couple of uh, days the things that we might all agree on in, as being self-evidently worthwhile things to do, and things that are needed for the effectiveness of our efforts in stopping the ongoing genocide and other forms of mass atrocities in Sudan. But for the sake of clarity, if it helps, let me summarize two or three propositions and state them very clearly so there's no ambiguity about them. You can agree or disagree uh, when we have a discussion. And also to summarize some of the packages that might be needed. And this was referred to in, in the panels before. The first point to make is that we need a comprehensive approach. 
as you saw from the, from, from, from the video there, this conflict on, all, on many different fronts can't be solved unless the whole conflict is solved. So there is no peace in Darfur without there being a resolution in the Nuba Mountains. And there can be no security across Sudan and South Sudan without the legitimate needs or the people of these marginalized areas being affected. And let me remind our friends in South Sudan that their independence has been won by the blood of Nubans, Blue Nilers, and Darfuris. <laughs> this new country that deserves all our support in its journey ahead, and which brings us hope and inspiration for all the oppressed peoples in Africa and elsewhere, must remember the historical debt it owes to the people, to the people I've just mentioned. And the reason for this, those who know your history much better than, uh, uh, than I, know why that is the, is the case. Because the current problems of these marginalized areas, the two areas as they're called, but there are more than two, are a result of a comprehensive peace agreement that is neither comprehensive nor a peace or an agreement that one can actually dignify by the name of uh, actually being a genuine agreement. Sure, South Sudan got its independence. But all the other in elements that were part of the comprehensive deal never got implemented. And hence, you saw in the video what is going on now. And this is the third season that these things are, are going on. Similarly, I recall from my period as the UN coordinator in Sudan, trying to draw world attention to the issues of the conflict in, in Darfur, which eventually became a genocide. And I was told right here in this, uh, in this very city of Washington, D.C., with senior staffers in the White House, National Security Council, when, when you're the UN coordinator, you get, you meet, you'll get access to all these people. And in London, my own home country, my own, own capital city, and in Oslo, and in Paris, and in Rome, and in Brussels, all the places where I went to. I was told to shut up about Darfur because the problems of Darfur would be solved when the, com when the uh, conference, when the Nawasha talks were successful and the framework for liberating, uh, uh, you know, for a new Sudan would be formed, eventually led to South Sudan. And when those things were done, then Darfur's problems would also be solved. So what happened was that the suffering of the people of Darfur was sacrificed on some geopolitical, geostrategic uh, calculation done in some committee rooms in London, Paris, Washington, and other, other places. To the eternal shame of these people. They were not even good political analysts. It would have been one thing if they had been right, if they had been clever, but they were not. They were wrong. So it is that Darfur burnt while people fiddled with the different protocols of Navasha. I was there. I was representing the UN. The, but as someone said earlier on, the moral authority of the UN had been subcontracted to a self-selected troika of the US, the UK, and Norway, normally good countries, and nothing wrong with them individually, or collectively for that matter. But when the premier institution of the world, the United Nations system, created after all that happened in the Second World War, you know, with the energy of this country, subcontracts out its principal business, then don't be surprised that what happens is not a legitimate outcome as far as the world is concerned, or as far as at least certain countries are concerned. Now, this, in a sense, we have to go back. And the question of accountability was raised earlier in the panel. Who were these desk officers, politicals? I think you call them smart asses here in, in America, in American language. <laughs> who were doing their kind of clever calculations, sitting not very far from here, or in London, in Whitehall, making their little, uh, uh, you know, moving their little pawns, thinking there was a great game being played out there. In Damasha, as I hung around the bar in the negotiations there, 
Because, you know, Navasha talks, mostly these peace talks, they're very boring. Nothing happens for days on end, uh, you know, and people just hang around bars and restaurants because what happens is uh, nothing, and then suddenly there's a spurt because people are meeting secretly in rooms, and then suddenly there's a movement, and the rest of the time you spend just hanging around, really, and I wasted a lot of time in Navasha. Good beer, though, good Kenyan beer. <laughs> and would you believe it? The negotiators that were shepherding this, not General Sumboya of Kenya, who deserves eternal uh, respect for the amazing work he did, but all the negotiators from the West, from the US, from the UK, from Norway, sitting in the same bar, I, I would try to get them to buy my drinks because you know, the UN is paid less than uh, the people. And they, so they were talking about who would win the Nobel Peace Prize for bringing peace to Sudan. And this wasn't the question of Nobel Peace Prize for the countries. They were talking about the Peace Prize for themselves. In other words, the personal egos of the individual negotiators. And so the, it, it all feeds into what it is, really. This is just a game, a game where you can build a career as a diplomat, as, as an aid worker, or whatever you like, and even an advocate, uh, activist, I suppose. So that is a sad and shabby story of the deals all around that. And talking to a senior British official who I probably should not name here, as we are on a live, a live uh, a broadcast, but uh, he knows who he is. When we raise the issue of, but how are we going to implement some of the uh, elements of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, the, you know, the, the kind of different protocols of Navasha and so on, uh, there was no answer. Just get the bloody deal signed. And we'll figure it out afterwards. We are still figuring it out. So what you see here is the uncomplete business of state formation and the uncomplete business of history finding its natural progression until there is a resolution. And the people responsible for the current troubles are not just al-Bashir and all the others, of course they bear the primate, prime, uh, prime responsibility, but those who made flawed judgments and made presumptions which, go which governed the life chances of millions of people in the last decade that has gone by. There is no accountability for them. Kofi Annan, my boss in the United Nations, the Secretary General, I reported to him as his representative. He, pre he presided over the Rwanda genocide. At that time, he was the head of peacekeeping. And I was there in 94 myself, very few days, two days after Paul Kagame took control of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, Kigali. And I was uh, basically representing the UK and went on to head the humanitarian operation in Rwanda. And General Delaire, who, who I met subsequently, recalls, if you've read his book, about what happened when he tried to draw the UN's attention to what was going on in, in Rwanda. And now it has subsequently emerged that many members of the Security Council in Rwanda, sorry, Security Council at the time of Rwanda in 94, did not know what was going on because the Secretariat of the United Nations, including Kofi Annan, the head of peacekeeping, were filtering the information so the member states never got full information. Genocide one, the last genocide of the last century. Srebrenica, Kofi Annan was the head of peacekeeping there also. And the history on that is also now well known. Now the question I ask is, you can have one genocide on your hands and put it down to inexperience. Sorry, put it down to inexperience, yeah. The second one you can be forgiven for, you know, maybe a mistake. Three genocides on your hand and you get a Nobel Prize. What kind of insult is this for the millions who were killed by genocides in Rwanda, Srebrenica, and then now uh, subsequently in, in Darfur? No one has taken away the Nobel Prize. What is the value of that? How can a man who is actually 
been directly responsible for inaction of a global system in whom the full trust of nations is vested, can sleep at night. And then, a few weeks, months ago, he's appointed UN and AU special envoy for Syria. And of course he failed, like he failed everywhere else, you see. As someone, uh, as an American journalist said, if you want to find the gray spot between black and white, the fudge between truth and falsehood, Kofi is your man. Now, the reason I'm saying this in such blunt and explicit terms is, you cannot ask for accountability for just Bashir and Haroon and so on without also examining the whole system that allows these people to flourish. <laughs> in all fairness, this is not equating the moral responsibility. There is no question that the Sudanese leadership is responsible for what we have witnessed. But all of history teaches us, ever since history began, that these things don't happen by themselves. They happen through acts of commission, but they also happen through acts of omission and acts of condoning. So we are all guilty. I, as the United Nations resident coordinator, if you like, am also guilty. I tried my best, but it's kind of you to be complimentary about that, but it was not good enough. Where is my accountability? So, the first point, this is only my first point, by the way. <laughs> the point is that there is no moving forward. There is no chapter, closing of chapters, unless that accountability takes place at all levels, whether it is in the White House or whatever, whether it is in the global institutions like the UN, or whether it is actually in relation to the genocides who are indicted uh, war criminals by the International Cr Criminal Court. But we must take that big picture uh, in, in, into account. My second uh, point is to reinforce what's been said on occasion, but perhaps not clearly enough, and that is that the, there is no moral or practical basis for negotiating with genocides. We did not do this with Hitler. They tried at the very beginning. And then what happened? You know, he soon proved that he, he couldn't keep his agreement, and then the world had to go to war. You know, now we're telling Nubans. One Nuban young man said to me on this trip that you've seen videoed, he said, my sister has been raped. My mother has been assaulted. My father has been insulted. My fields have been taken away. My children are living in the caves. You're telling me to negotiate with Bashir? And even if I do that, are you, the international community, going to stand by and guarantee that he will keep his agreements when you haven't done any standing by and guaranteeing any of the past agreements? Anyway, he doesn't keep his agreements. Everyone knows that. So on what basis is the African Union going about its peacemaking process? It is morally flawed. On what basis is the United Nations Security Council urging the, all these processes and banks, and apart from contracting out to the African Union, what it, the UN should be doing in partnership, of course, but not asking the African Union to do the heavy lifting alone? On what basis is this? It's going to fail. Because all through history, and I have been involved in most of the world's major uh, uh, conflicts the last sort of 20 years of a career, whether it's Sierra Leone, whether it's Angola, uh, and elsewhere. And you know from your own experiences in this, in this continent, in Latin America, the, the, the great uh, problems of in Central America and so on. It never works when you do deals with morally reprehensible people. Why should it work here? If you don't learn from history, you are doomed to repeat it, as someone said it. So, Ultimately, of course, there has to be a negotiated settlement because in the end, politics always has to find the way to a solution, always is, no matter how difficult it is. There's always a political agreement to be made. But no political agreement sticks until it is on the basis of a moral and ethical structure in which justice and accountability are a part of it. 
I had some personal taste of this because I was in a senior position in the British government at the time. And as you know, Sierra Leone is close to British uh, uh, hearts and minds and responsibilities. And uh, I remember being part of 17 peace negotiations, peace agreements, I would say, between the rebellious movement, the one uh, that cuts off arms and legs in, in Sierra Leone, and, uh, and uh, the fragile uh, uh, democratic government. All of them failed because they were trying to do deals. It was only when special courts were set up, people were uh, called to account, and so on and so forth, that an agreement stuck, and Sierra Leone could now progress uh, on some kind of uh, path for the future. There's no difference between Sierra Leone and Sudan in respect to the basic principles that must apply if we are to have justice, accountability, and ultimately peace, security, and, and, and development. So I don't understand the current basis on which the processes are currently. I don't understand why the US administration of the European Union are endorsing the Doha process, which is basically validating the ethnic cleansing in, in, uh, in uh, Darfur. I heard recently uh, through uh, some, uh, 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 the BBC monitoring service. The BBC has a monitoring service that picks up the news reports in all languages and then it transcribes that into English and then it's available to anyone who's got a few thousand pounds to spare. I don't have, but I've got someone who uh, feeds me this information free. I heard that a billion US dollars are now going to flow into Darfur. They already started flowing to, for the Darfuri development. You know what this development is? As I saw from my trip, I, when I was not, didn't get into Darfur this time, but uh, close by, yes, there is development going on in Darfur. Yes, there are roads being built, uh, clinics being built, agriculture being restarted. But you know who's benefiting? It is all the new inhabitants of Darfur who, re who claim the land vacated by the 300,000 refugees sitting in Chad. So I'm disgusted when my own British Minister for Development uh, goes to, goes to, uh, goes to uh, Sudan and says, we are going to give aid. You know, there's wonderful, great things happening in Darfur. Sure, the great things happening uh, in Darfur. But not for Darfuris. They're still sitting in the camps. They've been cleansed out. That is why we call Sudan the most successful genocide. The reason it's more successful than Rwanda is that the Rwandan genocide got reversed. People died, a million people died. No one can do anything about people who die. But what happened was that there was a fight back. The country was reclaimed. People have returned. I was there in Rwanda only last week. And basically the ethnic project of Rwanda was terminated and then reversed. Society will heal at its own pace and life will go on. But it was reversed. In Sudan, we have the most successful genocide because not only is it not reversed, was actually it's been consolidated. The facts on the ground are being affected. Because obviously, for, on humanitarian considerations, those tribes, non darfuri tribes that are, uh, no, of, of different origin, uh, non-African uh, 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 tribes, you're not going to expel them 10 years from now because they will then get established. So you have a, a completely spread. And the international community, with the so-called Doha process, and all this aid that is now going in, is actually aiding and abetting the completion of the project that even Bashir has not managed to, com to complete. The reason I say Bashir has not managed to complete is because of all the resistance. When I went to the Nuba Mountains, what I saw was not the suffering alone, but I saw the stubborn will of the people. And I was sure, and I'm confident that the people of Nuba Mountains and these other areas, they will prevail as long as they continue to resist. But for the international community, we may ask them to do, us, do some good. But please, if the international community can't do any good, at least do no harm. What that means is you don't have aid policies that actually complete Bashir's job for him. What he could not kill with bombs and bullets can be killed, can be completed with the wrong aid, provide the wrong way to the wrong people for the wrong ends. And that's what worries me at the, at, at the moment. As you said, Khartoum is much more skilled nowadays, and we're moving on to a new phase of this project, really. That's what worries me, uh, what worries me now. The third uh, point uh, I wanted to say, I'm only on the th third point, and that is the Sudanese must lead in all this. 
as I think uh, Luis Ocampo said it very bluntly yesterday, you're on your own. I would just qualify that statement slightly by simply just reminding ourselves that you certainly have to do the lead, you certainly have to lead how you decide on your own destiny and you will get the destiny you deserve if you're allowed. But as you know, the reason Sudan is special is not because this isn't just another war in another African country, of which there are many, but because it, crimes against humanity have been and are being perpetrated. And a crime against humanity in one place is a crime against all humanity everywhere. <laughs> that is why I too am a Sudanese. And that is why, yes, Sudan must lead, and Sudanese voices must decide their own fates of, the, of their nation, and we should help them, and at least not hinder them. But we cannot leave them alone. We know the price of leaving people alone in other previous genocides. Because this is not just another war. These are crimes against humanity. So, these are my basic premises, uh, which would underpin any approach. The rest is detail. We can argue about it. It's important, maybe not so important, opportunities and so on. So the other measures I think we've talked about, I won't spend much more time on them, simply to say that there can be no business as usual with a regime like Sudan. I have discovered through the Freedom of Information Act process in the United Kingdom, I think an innovation in transparency borrowed from the United States far too late in the history of the United Kingdom, but better late than never. There's several millions of pounds of British government money, including British taxpayer money, my, tax, my money, now that I don't uh, work in the UN, I do pay taxes again, <laughs> have been used to provide defense assistance to the Sudanese armed forces in the last two, three years. Now, when we question this, the answer is, this is for human rights training of the Sudanese armed forces. It's like saying, wind back to the Second World War, it's like saying we should provide some uh, kind of customer relations uh, uh, training to the concentration camp guards in Nazi Germany. So when we come to accountability then, sure Bashir is responsible, but all accountability starts close to home. Personal, those around us. So our governments, they're almost equally to blame. And I think that really needs to be recognized. In fact, one of the propositions I'd like to put to you, one idea I'd like to put to you, is that borrowed from uh, examples of other sectors is, whether the legal framework in countries like the US or the, in, within the European Union are strong enough to allow class action to be brought by the survivors of these massacres who are in residence now in, in these countries, whether as refugees or as uh, asylum seekers or whatever. Class action against the governments, certainly I can speak for in the, within the European Union. Darfur is in the UK, would have a case to make. It would bring the British government to the courts and say, your deliberate neglect of this issue by not honoring your international obligations as required in the various conventions has resulted in suffering loss, damage, and seek punitive, uh, punitive damages. If you can do that for smoking, why can't, you do the, why can't you do it for this? And if they find no restitution in the British courts, there is the innovation of the uh, European courts of human rights courts. Now, even if this case doesn't go very far, the act of bringing it in will reveal many things. 
things that I know from my previous role in government, intelligence information. We knew from almost day one what was going on in Darfur. We could have acted at a stage where the Khartoum regime had not gone on to the final solution. And if we had done that, I am absolutely confident from my position and knowledge in being both in British government, just before I got to the UN, and being at the heart of the UN, in fact, leading the UN, maybe the Sudanese government, the Khartoum regime, would not have gone to the extreme option of a completed genocide. This is because if it intervened early with the right signals to the Khartoum regime, they may have drawn back. Because one of the experiences of genocide completion are that when the logic of spilling blood is that the more blood you spill, the only way forward is to spill more blood <coughs> until all blood is spilled. You know? So if you're going to murder someone, if you raid someone's house, and someone sees you murdering, so you murder the second person who's a witness to the first, uh, the first murder. And the tragedy of this never again uh, process is that we had the opportunity to intervene with the knowledge we had. We, because the Darfur genocide was the first genocide of the media age. In, in, the, in the Rwanda, uh, poor General Dallaire, he sent his memos to Kofi Annan and so on. But there was no media, there was no internet, um, uh, there was no kind of emails even. So the point here is that the tragedy of Darfur is that we have not only, only the Nazis uh, with the efficiency that characterized that particular culture at the moment in time, recorded in huge detail what had happened in the Holocaust. Since then, fast forward to Darfur, and we were observing, watching, recording, right down to the names of villages and uh, military units and uh, individual uh, case, uh, case testimonies. We never knew so much about what was happening. So lack of information could never be used as an alibi for lack of a, uh, either a lack of early warning or lack of, of action. Now, so there's a case to be made that if countries don't act on that, they should be tried in courts. Not just Bashir should be tried in industrial criminal court, but those who willfully did not act. This is important because unless you do that, future officials will hide behind the anonymity of institutions and will go that particular way as well. I am uh, finishing soon, and I just want to uh, recap uh, the uh, a paper I wrote about uh, six years ago when I was recovering from Darfur. And I wrote a paper where I talked about the eight different excuses why Darfur happened and why it could happen again. And I just want, with your permission, to quickly, in two minutes, read, read those. Because it seemed to me not much has changed in that, in that regard. So this is what I wrote in 2006. These were the eight different excuses that were put to me as I did my round of preventive diplomacy and failed. The first reaction was cynicism. What do you expect in Sudan? It is a nasty place where people have been doing nasty things to each other for so long. What is different here? This was said to me by a British senior diplomat. The second reaction was denial. Surely the situation is not as bad as you make it out to be. You're exaggerating, Mukesh. You're always a dramatic person. You're exaggerating to gain attention, said by a senior UN official to me in New York, very close to the Secretary General Kofi Annan. The third reaction was prevarication. You have to be patient, Mukesh. You're such an impatient guy. It takes time. In any case, it's best if they find their own solutions to their own problems, Brussels. The fourth excuse was caution. You know, these are complicated, difficult matters. Sudan is not a small country. If you intervene, it'll only make matters worse. Let's think careful, carefully first. Rome. The fifth alibi was distraction. You know that we have other things to do too. Let's solve the more important pressing issues first, and then we'll think about this one, Darfur. Paris. The sixth report was back passing. Why does it have to be us all the time? Other countries, groups need to do their bit. Let someone else take this on, and then we will join in. Washington, DC. 
The seventh reason was evasion of responsibility. Thanks, Mukesh. We listened to you. And we brought this to the attention of the President, Prime Minister, Pope, Secretary General, Commission, Council, Committee, my auntie, my grandmother. Uh, so it's being discussed at a very high level. Let's see what they decide. And this is from the network of uh, some NGOs who were exercised by it. Finally, helplessness. You know we can't really act because we have to get a proper framework for intervention. Discussions will take place and then we'll do something. Bureaucrats everywhere. These were the eight excuses why we failed in Darfur and why listening to what we've been talking about yesterday, it seems that many of the same excuses still prevail today. I very much hope that in our discussion to follow in a minute, we can kind of reflect on some of this. I've cut out lots of other provocative things I was going to say. I will just mention one of them. And that is an idea taken from uh, uh, elsewhere in other spheres. And that is to offer a bounty for Bashir. There's actually already a website, already launched. It's uh, in uh, seclusion at the moment, called bountyforbashir.org or com or something like that. See. Let the people of the world pledge a dollar, 10, 20. And let's test global public opinion. How much are they prepared to pay for the arrest of Bashir? We can't rely on governments alone. Because a crime against humanity in one place is a crime against humanity everywhere. So it is for humanity to decide their collective response beyond governments. Thank you.